My name is Boris Stipe. I'm going to shepherd you through this introductory workshop on exploratory data analysis with R. Um, <clears throat> my, my original background many, many, many years ago is actually in medicine, but it devolved rapidly from that. From medicine, I went into molecular biology and then into um, protein biophysics and protein engineering and trying to predict aspects of protein folding with computational methods and becoming more and more interested in more abstract ideas of bioinformatics and computational methods. <coughs> and, and really coming from, from protein folding and protein engineering, becoming interested in complex systems. What makes systems complex rather than just complicated? Why is it so hard to predict um, how biomolecular systems work? How, why is it so hard to predict uh, how proteins would fold? I mean, all the information is there in the sequence, but why is it so hard to get it out of the sequence? And ultimately, this led me to some interests in why does evolution work in the first place and what does it all mean? I mean, literally, what is the meaning of biology or in biology? And there's an interesting uh, parallel in the concept of meaning because if we look at how evolution works, we can kind of equate the idea of meaning with the idea of function. So function in biology, i.e. in the sense that it is that which is conserved on the evolutionary landscape <coughs> and provides the uh, selective advantages, um, we, we, can, we can certainly to some level say, well, that's the meaning of that protein. Now, if I would ask the 30 people in this room to give me a definition of function, I would maybe get 35 different definitions, some of them compatible, some of them not compatible. And even though this is a word that we very, very often use, um, we don't actually have a definition for it. We use surrogates. We use things like, what are the go terms that are associated with a gene? And that's very convenient. Somebody has told us what the function is or how we could label the function. But it's more subtle and, and more different than that. Even uh, the same protein of the same sequence can have slightly different functions in different organisms. So function always arises as an interaction of whatever the protein is and does with its context and its environment. So we're in a, in a, in a domain of uncertainty. And this is why we need things like exploratory data analysis. The main idea of exploratory data analysis is we're using numerical analysis and graphical presentation. Graphics, graphics is very important in exploratory data analysis. Um, without a particular underlying model or hypothesis in order to do things like uncover underlying structure in the data looking at some particular feature in the data, is it all just amorphous, distributed in, in, in the same way? Or is there something there that, that is different from what I would expect from a random model? And if I can find something that's different from what I expect, say from a random model or something, that always means there's something operating that makes it so. And that's usually what interests us. We can define important variables. Our data, <coughs> if we have numbers associated with our data, usually there are large numbers and there are small numbers. And what aspects of our data make some features come out having large values and some features having small values? That's the domain of uh, regression analysis. We can try to detect outliers and anomalies. So the idea of averaging is not just to say, well, what's common among everything, but also to be able to say which of my data elements are very different, and then be, being able to ask, why could they be different? Why don't all genes behave in the same way? <clears throat> then to detect trends, of course, um, and that's often in, in the kind of applications that we do, the, the question of how can we make predictions from our data? 
and then perhaps develop statistical models. Um, I think we'll talk a little more tomorrow about what a statistical model means. And we can test underlying assumptions. So the goal of exploratory data analysis really is hypothesis generation, not hypothesis testing. And that has a lot, being able to generate hypotheses has a lot to do with you know, creatively playing with your data. You don't really know what it is going to tell you. You have to poke it until it starts um, telling its story. So therefore, it's very often the first step of analysis. Once you have a hypothesis, you can throw more sophisticated statistical tools at it and, and uh, find whether your hypothesis is statistically validated, i.e., whether, say, the predictions it would make are statistically significant. But in order to be able to do that, you need a hypothesis to start with. <clears throat> so in practice, things we do in EDA is computing and tabulating basic descriptors of data properties, such as ranges, means, quantiles, variances. These are things that we will start out with this morning. And then we can take these numbers and generate graphics from them, box plots, histograms, scatter plots, see how they relate to each other. We apply transformations such as log or rank transformations um, <clears throat> to remove some of the numeric variants and, and bring out features more clearly in our data. We can compare observations to statistical models such as QQ plots. We'll be doing some of these rank, rank plots or, or quantile, quantile plots. Uh, we can simplify data, we can use clustering f to uh, find underlying structure, and all with the final goal to find statistical models or better ideas that we can then use as appropriate for hypothesis testing and prediction. Now ours is really very excellent for that. Um, not just because it's a full feature programming language and it has a lot of extensions uh, so it can work as a statistical workbench and because it's in fact actually a language to write domain specific languages in very many different domains and much work has been done to write a, a subset of R suitable for high throughput molecular biology with the bioconductor project. But one of the very useful things of R is it has easy access to graphics. So plotting routines, graphical routines, ways to visualize data are really inbuilt. And <clears throat> that is a factor that, was, that is usually not as well integrated with the language in other languages that are being used for data analysis. Um, the packages and libraries, i.e. contributed code, are very, very well vetted and they're uh, very sophisticated. And there's a large community and a, and, and a growing community. Um, and that's important. If you ever have questions, you will find experts in the field. So <clears throat> maybe 10 or 15 years ago, almost all of bioinformatics in the lab was done with Perl. Then people started realizing Perl is kind of you know, awkward and not, not so it, it has its deficiencies in, in if you want to write rigorous and, and, and reproducible code. Um, so people started to, to um, embracing object-oriented paradigms like working with Python, um, which is a, a, a very excellent scripting language, which has a very great following. But I think currently much of bioinformatics is, is done uh, in R. Um, interestingly, um, we tend to work with these so-called scripting languages much more than with compiled languages. So maybe this is changing a little bit in the age of high throughput genomics because um, if you can have compiled code for a problem, it may run up to 100 times faster than um, if you're using a scripted language such as R. Now, Therefore, many of R's packages um, actually use compiled code in the background um, and then, then communicate uh, for speed uh, with these compiled um, 
elements. So you can get the best of both worlds there. But what's really important for R is <coughs> that you can put your programs into scripts and you can work interactively with the scripts line by line and you can develop things and you can change things very rapidly. So it's extremely flexible. And as a software development paradigm, in the typical molecular biology laboratory, this is extremely important because um, we don't build large static applications that are going to be around for years and years and years. We build small flexible scripts to solve individual problems. We write up the results, we send them off, we hope to get them published, and then we move on to the next project. So our software development always works against moving targets. Once we've solved the problem, we put it away. It's not, no longer science to solve it again and again and again. We solve a new problem. And this is why in many lab, uh, bioinformatics laboratories, we basically just use small scripting languages because they're most flexible to mix and match and combine and patch things together and, and build, build new things. So this is why why R, or some of the reasons why R, um, why R has become so successful in, in, in bioinformatics. Graphics, yes. Good graphics are immensely valuable. Um, <coughs> when is a graphic good? Well, that's actually quite simple. In, in, in a good graphic, every displayed element will support the information that you're trying to convey with the image. You don't put in extraneous things. You may highlight some things with color, um, but <clears throat> the more graphical elements are in your um, data, uh, are in your plot, that don't directly convey the message, the more likely it is that your message is not going to be transported by the graphic. <coughs> There's a lot of um, good examples available, um, and, but fundamentally there's just one simple and easy rule, use less ink. So the, less, the least possible amount of ink that you can use to convey a particular message, um, the more, most likely your message is going to be um, received. So this means make sure that all the elements in graphics are necessary, all the elements in graphics are informative, and all the information in your data is displayed. But not all of R's defaults use as little ink as possible, and if you use a package like ggplot, you're going to teach ggplot, Lauren, right? Yeah. That's awesome, because I usually don't. Um, that's, this is an example from ggplot, um, a so-called bubble chart, and things become, you know, very, very, very easy there. Um, maybe tomorrow morning, after you've had the ggplot experience, we can, we can do a little bit of discussion. Why I don't use ggplot and <laughs> why you will probably find it awesome. Yeah? Uh, can we have the presentation on the screen? Can you have that presentation? Okay, just to the screen. Can I full screen it? Well, it becomes so inflexible then. I mean, I'll make it a little, a little larger. You don't actually need to read it. I'm, I'm Let me make it a little larger, 175. Eh, that should work. OK. Um, Right, so here's a, here's a different example of graphics. Um, this is taken from an article from the internet from Microsoft TechNet. And the caption um, was about plotting capabilities of Microsoft Excel. And what it says is, what if you could gussy up a report or pretty up a chart without much additional work? What if using just one extra line of code you could create a Microsoft Excel column chart that included a cool gradient fill like this one. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then we can discuss, um, doesn't become much better to see, whether we can count 
the ways in which this graphic is wrong. <laughs> like wrong with a capital W. Any, does anybody notice something odd here? So, uh, my God, what does it even say? So, these, these are numbers, something about uh, system usage and um, these are different Windows operating systems and numbers of computers. Okay. So assume this is, this is a number of operating systems um, that are installed on the numbers of computers. Numbers of computers would be here and this is Windows uh, whatever and Windows XP and Windows 2008 and, and so on. Why is it in 3D? Yeah. Is, is the 3D effect helpful? No. Actually, it's distracting, right? Because you, it becomes much harder to see what is this number? Where, where does this number go to on that scale? It becomes quite difficult. How many numbers have been used to generate that plot? <clears throat> five numbers. So this is a chart that represents five numbers in five different categories. What about the cool gradient fill that they were talking about? It's hard on the eyes. It doesn't give any extra information. It doesn't give any extra information at all. It's just painting of these stacks. See how the, the black and the black don't line up? It's just, you know, painting of the stacks. Sometimes we use gradient fills to, to emphasize in a 3D plot. Um, where in the vertical dimension we are, and so on. So, <clears throat> since the question w was what if, uh, I think the answer should be that would be pretty terrible. Um, so, th these are actually only five numbers for such a huge plot. There are no units given. Um, if you are a graduate student, and I happen to be in one of your seminars, um, and there are no units in one of the <laughs> uh, graphics that you present, um, I will probably call that out. Um, so don't let that happen. The colors are meaningless. They don't have any connection to the actual scale, and the range differs for each stack. The 3D um, doesn't mean anything and, and makes it different. So. The point I'm making here is um, if you have very highly sophisticated uh, graphics capabilities, that does not absolve you to think about your data presentation and your information design in an equally highly sophisticated way. And the more you can do, the more restraint is appropriate to get things right. So where do we, where do we learn from? Where do we find exemplars? I find two excellent sets. Um, <clears throat> of information on on Reddit. So I I try not to go on Reddit at all if possible because it's 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 such an amazing time sink. Uh, I get <laughs> anyway don't get me started on procrastinating. But <clears throat> this Reddit on uh, visualization is, is is quite nice because you have data visualization examples. And the, the good thing is, you don't only have the data visualization examples, you have comments about it. So people comment there and call out what's good and what's bad about it. So from following this kind of discussion, you can start developing an intuition of how to, how to make effective uh, plots and make effective data. Um, similar here is the subreddit, uh, data is beautiful. So this often takes current um, data visualization um, results that, that people have, have recently posted and, and that maybe ha made the news or that are somehow other interesting. And once again, the comments here are what, what really makes it powerful. Okay. <clears throat> so very vaguely, if we talk about statistics, we can divide the world into descriptive and into inferential domains. So descriptive statistics tells us 
what the features of our data are. Inferential statistics takes statistical models and makes predictions about um, what the what the features in samples from the population that we have not yet observed could possibly be. Um, so we'll, we'll start out with some uh, s descriptive statistics on the data that we've looked at. And, oh yeah, and, and all in all, um, I would like to place these two days, as I did the day yesterday, under, under this one motto. Um, not knowing is the most intimate. And here's the story um, that I pulled out of this uh, classic book of equanimity. Um, attention, Master Jizo asked Hogan. So Jizo is a very famous abbot, uh, Zen Buddhist, and Hogan at that time um, was a pilgriming monk. <coughs> Where have you come from? And he answered, I pilgrimage aimlessly. What is the matter of your pilgrimage? I don't know. So. To a certain degree, this could apply to you as well here. Um, why are we learning exploratory data analysis, for example? And then Jesus replied, not knowing is the most intimate. Now, to a certain level, you could think of this as a, as a contradiction. And many of Zen Kuan's are contradictions that simply are meant to make you think about it. But I think applying this to this <coughs> to this workshop here is quite appropriate. Not knowing does not mean knowing nothing. You all know a lot. You know a lot about biology. You don't know that much about exploratory data analysis with R. I presume, maybe you know more than I do, but I, I think you have a reason to be here. Um, so in that respect, you're both in a state of knowing and in a state of not knowing. But what makes anything we learn today, or we, we talk about today and tomorrow, meaningful at all, is if you are able to relate it back to what you know. It makes it meaningful if your knowledge can be expressed in new ways. If you can, if you can drive this whole exploration with your insights about biology. And I'll be calling you out a lot. I'll be looking at data with you, and, and the question is always going to be, come up with some idea of the kind of questions we could ask. And then let's talk about how we can take such an idea and translate that into code. That's ultimately what we are going to do. And in the end, <laughs> I hope, um, achieve some great enlightenment. So let's get started with that. Um, the Bioinformatics.ca EDA27 teen page has instructions on how to load our current RStudio project for today. So if you've been here yesterday, it's exactly the same procedure except with a different project name as the repository URL. If you're new here, it works in exactly the same way um, as the R Introduction to the Environment project that I hope you have uh, done with the introductory uh, R tutorial. So the first step that already should have been done is you should have created a project directory somewhere on your computer. If you don't have a project directory yet, make one now. If you don't know how to do that, Lauren and Greg will help you. But um, start by having a project directory then. Open RStudio, select File, New Project, click on the version control, click on Git, and then enter <coughs> HTTPS github.com. Hugin REDA introduction as the repository URL. Type tab character. This should then autofill. And then find your project directory, click Create Project, type in it into the console pane. And when you're done with that, please show us your blue or green or um, bluish post-it so we know you're done. And we'll reconnect at that point at the stage here. Everything should look approximately like this.
As a little check whether everything is correct, you should have a file called myscript.r at the bottom of the list of files in the files pane. So I'm all of these little sections here are, are called panes, uh, pane as in window pane, P-A-N-E, not as in uh, P-A-I-N. Um, and myscript.r, if you click on it, gets opened in the editor pane. And I've provided this as a file that you can um, work with and edit and put in your notes, treat it as your lab journal for today. Um, you, can, you can write in R code and try things out and play around with it. And when you save it, it's not going to be overwritten if we um, update the version of the project at some point and you pull it back uh, from the GitHub server. So this will, this will not get overwritten. Um, this is why it's in a special file. <coughs> So if you put comments into the main script file, REDA introduction, and then I post an update, your comments will be lost, or worse, if you've committed them, um, our studio will need to require you to, to reconcile the editing conflicts in order to load anything at all. OK, and um, there's a table of contents. Um, for the different sections if you need to reconnect. Uh, using the line numbers gives us a good reference of where we are in, in this code. So let's look at uh, project files. What's in the box? <clears throat> um, this is a typical RStudio project. At the top is a file called gitignore, um, which tells version control which files in this project are not under version control. So sometimes our studio builds temporary files, and these should not be saved in the version control database. There's the file init.r that um, contains a function which creates this myscript.r file at the beginning. Um, there's a file called our history. This is empty. In this file, you can store previous commands. This may be useful for looking up commands, but in order to actually do some work on a particular project, um, we, we keep all working commands in, in the script file. So the script file is actually your most important project asset um, at home. In principle, you could copy and paste things from our history, but of course, our history contains everything w that we type on the console or that gets imported into the console. So it also contains all of the errors and all of the commands that inadvertently broke your data and so on and so on. So working with an R history file has, has its problems. Um, there's an R profile, which is the first file in a project that gets loaded when R Studio starts up a project. So in, in, your, in your own projects, you can use our profile files for project-specific configurations that you might want to do. So for example, um, our profile, when it gets run, it sources the file init.r. So when our studio starts this project, this file init.r gets sourced. It's a file that I've written to configure or help you configure something. The file init.r that gets run has a little command here which says if the file myscript.r does not exist, then make a copy of the file tmp.r, which is part of <coughs> the project files which I've uploaded to GitHub, and call it myscript.r. So since this file is newly created in your project, it's not under version control in whatever I do. And this is why it does not get overwritten when you download a new version. And then it puts um, our EDA introduction, i.e. the script file, into the editor. So this is how, it, how things start when, um, when everything starts up. Um, 
What else do we have? Our ref cards. Our ref card dot PDF. Um, let's have a look in this. So this is a file, PDF file, six pages, very dense. Um, that is a summary of R commands. So if you know all of these R commands, you know way, way more than I do. Um, <clears throat> it helps you kind of get an idea of, of what's out there. Um, and it's, I think this is most useful as a, as a concise, compressed version of commands that exist. So at some point, it might be useful to just read through it and then try to you know, get an intuition what's easily available and what's, what's perhaps missing. This may help you um, when you need to solve a particular problem to know um, how to phrase a Google uh, query <coughs> or how to phrase um, a request for information somewhere. So the, the idea is not really to learn this by heart. And the idea also really isn't um, to use this as a, as a reference because when you code in the R Studio IDE or Integrated Development uh, Environment, uh, you have all these references at your fingertips. So for example, um, if I take a random function here, um, say summary. <coughs> Once I type the first three characters, our studio tells me which commands possibly could continue my first three characters. So sum and summary. And then I can either click on it, um, or if it's selected, <coughs> use the tab character to extend it. And then all our functions. Uh, take usually a number of parameters, something they work on or something that allows us to modify their commands. And if I, um, in, in the editor, if I hover over a command, after a short time, a little um, a command signature or function signature is displayed. And that says the name of the function and what typical options or arguments or parameters could be passed to that function. So in this case, um, we get a summary of an object. And the three dots mean there are many other parameters and arguments that we could possibly use. If we want to learn more about what these are, <clears throat> you can use the Help tab in the, in the Assets pane. Um, and you can type summary. No, here. and get information on the usage and the arguments. So object, maximum sum, digits for formatting, additional arguments affect the summary, and that might be described in details. And the other thing is value. Um, value is always the return value of a function. So in order to use a function, you need to know um, what you put in and what you get out. What you get out is called value. It is what is used in a function, um, what, what, what is returned with the return statement of a function. And often there's also examples. <coughs> OK, so that was. <clears throat> the ref cards. There's a separate ref card file on, on data mining that might also be useful. Um, there are utility files. One is called read S3 and one is called type info. So type info is a little bit of code 
that uh, we discussed yesterday. It simply allows you to look inside the internals of an R object and figure out how it is structured, what it contains, what its attributes are, and, and uh, get all of that information very quickly. So we'll use that from time to time if, we're not, if we want to look in more detail at the internal structure of R objects. Templates that you can edit and, and use later on, one for how to basically write um, scripts in a meaningful way. Um, <clears throat> just as a, as a suggestion of how your own script files could be structured, you write down the purpose, version date, and author uh, notes. One early command that, that is usually um, always good to have in script files is to set the working directory to your project directory. We'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. Um, then to define and explain parameters. And then to, road, to load required packages. So if there are additional packages that you, that you use um, in your code, this is, a, this is a, a code paradigm that I like to use in script files. Um, so fundamentally, if you want to use a package, you need to go through two steps. You need to install the package once until you have it on your computer. So if you run the function install.packages and then give it a string of a package name, <clears throat> R will access a server at CRAN, C-R-A-N, the Collaborative R Archive Network, where all R uh, package, or no, where many R packages are stored and made publicly available. So the good thing about CRAN is that not just anybody can, can uh, can post stuff on CRAN. All packages on CRAN are extensively peer reviewed. They actually work. And they won't do any, anything ma malicious with your code. So they're, they're peer reviewed, they are uh, constructed from source, and they are carefully monitored that the package that's being distributed is byte for byte identical to the package that was originally uh, committed. So if you do that, then the package gets installed. We'll probably get to, yeah, we actually will get to installing some package uh, rather soon. And then in order to make it available in your current R session, you need to load it with the command library. So if we install the package R unit, then we can use the command library R unit to actually make the commands and the functions from within that package available in our current R session. Now in a script, um, <clears throat> I need to be sure that if I run a script and I use package functions and I want to source that script, I need to be sure that um, the package actually exists on the computer, but um, I don't want to load it via the internet every time this happens with all of its dependencies, and this can be a, a, a slow process. So I don't want to load it every time, but it has to exist. And in order to do that, I use the require command. So require command does the same thing as library, but it has a return value of true or false. So require loads the package. And if the package does not exist, require uh, returns a false. So if the package does not exist, this negation operator return, turns the false into a true. This means my if command applies to a true condition and then the inside block, install packages and our unit and library our unit are being executed. So this means if the package does not yet exist on my computer, it gets loaded from the internet and, and installed. Now, while it evaluates that condition, of course, it runs the require command. So if the package already existed, um, it gets loaded at that point and nothing else is done. So basically what this little if condition does, it, it loads the package from the internet only if it's not already on my computer. And um, 
the quietly equals true simply turns off the warning message that it didn't exist. It just works in the background in a script. The quietly equals true is not evaluated interactively. So this means if we actually source this command, um, then, sorry, if you source the command with a script file, nothing gets displayed. But if you, if you run it interactively, you will get a warning that the package didn't exist. So this can be confusing, because the warning comes up after the package gets, um, gets installed. We'll get to that. This is just to explain a piece of code that you will encounter often in, in, in the scripts we work with. Um, then we have a section of functions and a section where you have the actual process of your file, of, of your workflow. A section where you might put tests. Testing is always crucially important. And a line called end. I frequently share code by email or by attaching it. If I always include a line that I structure like this, at the end of a script, I can be sure that the entire file has been transmitted or that the entire file that I received is complete. Um, if I omit this once, it defeats the entire purpose of having it all the time. So this is not a language or syntax re requirement. It's just uh, a convention that I like to use to make sure that uh, the files that I pass around with and, and share with other people are and remain complete. So in my scripts, this line is always there. Um, somewhat similar is this file function template. If you write your own functions, you can copy that, for example, with RStudio by checking this little box. And under the More menu item, tell it to copy and then put in a new name. Try not to overwrite the old name. And um, that has basically all of the components that you would need to keep a nice, commented, structured um, piece of code for, 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 your, for writing your own functions. <clears throat> so this is just there to make life easier for the future. What else is there? There's some data there which we'll talk about. Oh, and there's two papers. Um, <clears throat> the papers are, one is uh, Jaiten et al. Uh, 2014 talking about single cell RNA analysis um, of hematopoietic cells or cells from the hematopoietic lineage. And that's the source of some of the data that we'll be using today and tomorrow. Um, so the, the paper explained it is there. Um, since it's copyrighted, as, as is the other paper, I've put it into a password-protected zip archive. Um, and the password is CBW in lowercase. Um, Weisgerber at all, we might discuss this in uh, tomorrow. We might not get around to it. Um, has some good ideas about uh, visualization and uh, what to do with bar, bar plots and when not to use bar plots. If you have ever sat through a um, biomolecular presentation of some sort, and I know all of you have, um, the great graphical paradigm there is the bar plot sometimes as a whisker plot or we also call them dynamite plots with little fuses sticking out at the top that make everything blow up. Um, and Weisgerber discusses how this is misleading and, and what some better alternatives are. And if you like, we, can, we, we could perhaps discuss on how to implement some of them. So this is some ancillary information and uh, the data that we will be working with. Now, to confirm that this is there, if you type the command get wd or get working directory, um, the computer R should, should tell you where in the world you currently are, where that directory is. And then if you list files um, without additional parameters, 
you will get the directory, the listing of this directory. So whenever we do something like read a file name or um, write a file name or list files or whatever, um, in order for this to work correctly, we in, in principle, we need a fully qualified path. Like on a Windows computer, it would start with C colon backslash um, my files backslash our project backslash CBW backslash and then whatever the file name is. Except if we don't give it a path but only a file name, um, the source of the file is the current working directory. And the current working directory can be um, obtained by typing get working directory. It can be set by set working directory um, where I enter some directory <clears throat> into a path. But it can also be set interactively in the session menu of our studio. And it can be set in different ways to the project directory, to the source file location, or to the files pane location. Um, so for example, you can then browse with the files pane somewhere else to, s to some other directory by clicking on the double button and going up and down. Um, and then use the set working directory to set the working directory to that directory. So it's relatively easy to navigate around and you rarely need to type uh, the entire path. Now I need to find back. Yes. Okay. So this is get working directory, set working directory, and, and the various options. <clears throat> In principle, um, when you loaded the project, the project should have set its own working directory to the correct uh, project directory. That's the way I, I set it up. Of course, it might work slightly differently um, on uh, Linux systems or on Windows systems, and I, I can't really test that. But I think it works. Nobody, at least yesterday, nobody complained that the project directories um, were not in the right <coughs> default working directory. Now, let's start with um, loading some data. It's the same data that we worked with yesterday. So, but I, I have it again here. Um, the way the data was loaded is in a script read s3.r because the data is based on uh, the so-called supplementary data file 3 uh, that is posted on the science website which accompanies um, this this paper and then after studying the script you should load the object LPS dat which is part of of the of the project directory um, in a compressed R data file LPS dat dot R data so Open the script, have a look at the script. It's slightly modified from what we, what we did yesterday. We, we uh, discussed it would be easier to skip lines that we don't need rather than removing them. And that's reflected in this updated version. And there's a note at the end on how to load the object. And I would like you to load that. And when you're done, and LPS dat is loaded as an R object with 1300 something files and I believe 16, uh, 1300 something rows and 16 columns uh, put up a green post it so we know you're there. <clears throat> now, s some of you are very new to this. Some of you are rather experienced with R and um, quickly done, and you don't have to be bored, and you don't necessarily have to go and check your Facebook or Twitter feeds. Um, terrible as that is. 
um, you, you can do other things. And I have two suggestions here. One is reproducible research requires testing of code. In order to make sure that your, that your programs are doing what they ought to be doing, um, they don't only have to be um, syntactically correct, they also need to uh, produce the correct results. And this is why you should get into a habit of writing tests, 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 whenever you do any kind of analysis. The test will take your analysis objects and confirm that the code that you've written um, produces results that <coughs> correspond to what you know the truth should be. There's an excellent package that supports that. It's called Test That. And you can install and load the Test That package from CRAN, um, explore the vignettes that it contains, explore the function that it contains, and you can try using Test That uh, functions and test that assertions to, as we go along, so simply write some tests into your myscript.r file um, to, to confirm whether something worked or didn't work. So if, we're on, if you're working on a task and you're already done and you feel you want to do something more and something else, write some tests. And the other thing that you could do if uh, there's some slack time that you want to pick up, there's a um, there's a, a tutorial page in some of my bioinformatics teaching about regular expressions. And I don't think we will be um, covering regular expressions in, our, in, this, in, in this session here, except very, very briefly, perhaps. But they're really, really important. When you work with any kind of textual data and you need to change things and massage things and, 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 and move things around, uh, regular expressions are your friend. Um, and you can learn more about regular expressions at that time. And if all of that is, is already old hat to you and, and you're no longer interested and you want to do something completely different, uh, you're welcome to replace me and, <laughs> <laughs> and teach part of this course. Good.
Can I assume everybody who doesn't have their post-it up just didn't put their post-it up? Or is there anybody still struggling with this? OK, I think we're, we're all done. So once you've executed this, these commands or just, just loaded the R data file, um, in the environment pane under the data section, LPS dat is then uh, made visible. Um, there's a little arrow here which we can use to look into the structure. Uh, the arrow tells me that there are columns colored, uh, called uh, by particular names. So there's genes, uh, b.control, b.lps, mf.control, mf.lps, and so on. It tells me the type of the column. Remember, this is a data frame. and the values in one column all need to be of the same type. So the first column has the um, values of type character, which are the individual gene name strings. All other <coughs> columns are numeric types, which are these numbers here. And if we want to inspect uh, what this um, data set actually contains, there's a little icon here looking like a a spreadsheet, if we click on that, um, this, the data set is, is shown to us. And um, we, we can check whether it contains what we think it ought to contain. OK. Now, just to recapitulate something we um, did yesterday, <coughs> Here are three tasks, same as we did yesterday about subsetting, i.e. picking out values um, of some kind that, um, that are found in our data set. So um, pick either this one, which is the simplest, or pick this one, which is a bit more involved. Um, you should be able to write that expression in one line. And it's quick to do. And I will, I will walk through this one in two minutes or so. Bless you. If you have any troubles or difficulties or need to ask questions, remember, put up your red post-it and somebody will fly in and take care of it.
So did everybody get something? I hope. Just for illustration, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through this example. Gene names and expression values for monocyte, monocytes that are stimulated by LPS for the top 10 expression values. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need the expression values for, for this column here. And we find that in this column. So we address it LPS dot dollar mo dot LPS. If I type that, I will get all 1300 expression values. I don't want all 1300 expression values, so I'll just look at the front of them with head. Okay, so I'm getting numbers here. So now I want only the top 10. How do I get the top 10? So I could sort them and then pick the first 10. But if I sort these numbers here, I would get the 10 highest numbers, but I wouldn't find, uh, I wouldn't know which genes they are. So I would, I would lose the relationship of the positions with the genes. So if I do something like, this here, the header of the sorted values, I get the highest values, or in this case, the lowest values. Um, but I don't know what these genes are. However, I need to put them in decreasing equals true, right? So I'm getting, I'm getting these values, but I don't know what the genes are. So I'm not, I don't use sort on problems of this type, but I use order. What order does is it gives me the, um, it gives me the index of the element according to its sorted order. So you see that the, the highest value here is 6.1 or minus 6.1. If I use order, um, <clears throat> order tells me this corresponds to the <clears throat> to the elements 205, 2, 367, and so on. So basically, I, I should predict that element 205 in this column here has the value six po minus 6.1. And that's what I need to solve this little task because if I use the value 205 from dollar genes, I have the associated genes name, H2EB1. <clears throat> so this is the top, the single top expression values. Okay, so I can put that together. I can say, um, get me from LPS dat. I want all the rows 
which have um, o ordered by expression values in a decreasing order. And in terms of columns, I want the columns genes and the column monocyte LPS. But now actually I don't want all of these, I only want the first 10. So I could put that whole vector into an auxiliary vector and then just pick out the first 10 elements of that auxiliary vector. But I can also do this and attach that right to the expression. It works in the same way. So I don't need to make an intermediate assignment. So if I haven't messed up, this single statement here gives me the gene names and the expression values for monocyte LPS cells for the top 10 expression values. Here we are. Row 205, 6.4, um, and so on. Could you extend this um, for the most differentially expressed um, genes? How would you do that? Where would you, where would you need to change? What do I even mean by that? So right now I'm sorting by the, by the highest absolute values. So you would order by the difference? I would order by the difference between control and stimulation. So how do I get the difference? Subtract. Subtract. Okay. How about um, highest differentially changed? Where I include both repressed and simulated. So you do the absolute value. Exactly. So I subtract them and take the absolute value. How do I get the absolute value of something in R? What would you guess? Abs? Do you think so? Yay! <laughs> You're right. Now, if you wouldn't have guessed, um, or you would have tried, and it didn't have worked, what would you have done? Google. Does it work? R absolute value. Okay, so here in this third link, <clears throat> without even clicking it, I see the apps function. So this is, again, coming back to this theme of not knowing. You might know what you need to do. You might not know the exact R function, but it's easy to find it. Exactly, so uh, here. I mean, I guess um, there, there's no need to make another column and then order that column. It inherently makes the nodes to compare the, uh, the rows. Okay, so that's, that's actually an interesting point. When do we make things as intermediate assignments and when do we just put it all into one state? If things are very straightforward and can, get, can, can never, never go wrong and don't need to be troubleshooted a lot, 
then we can just put it all into one single state. It's, it's compact and, you know. However, if you need to comment it, because it's not obvious why you're doing a particular operation, if you need to troubleshoot the individual steps or just um, um, confirm that they're valid and so on, then it's a better idea to go through, through intermediate assignments. So no, I can. I guess I'm, I misphrased what I was asking. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it seems to me as though, from a non computation perspective, <laughs> I would uh, intuitively think that if I subtract two columns, mm -hmm. the, the resulting uh, vector would mm -hmm. have to be stored on another column that has the same indices for the rows. Yes. That when I order them accordingly, yep. I have. The appropriate assignment. Is that you have the exactly. So you have the correct indices. But we don't. But we're not doing any of that. Uh, our our inherently knows how to do it. Yeah. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so uh, here we have. Um, We have the highest differential effects. Um, so this is this is the highest in in terms of um, this is the highest in, in terms of um, overall expression. Note that our minus six point one is not in this list at all anymore. Why? Well. It might have been very high, but it might also have been high in the controls. So there wasn't anything differential about it. So this is being stimulated. These two genes are being repressed. Now, if we would be doing an intermediate assignment, I could do it in this way. I assign it to some column, TMP, and then do the same thing with uh, TMP here, where TMP now is a numeric vector which contains all of the individual values. All right, so just to get our juices flowing, we've, <clears throat> we've loaded a data set, we've looked into the data set, we've taken values from that data set, and we've done small manipulations, and we've ordered things and, and selected top 10, and, and I hope if we do that again and again and again, it will start becoming more clear than it was yesterday. <laughs> um, so let's start talking a little bit about descriptive statistics and start making some simple plots. So descriptive statistics applied to that data set would ask things about what's the distribution of our values? What's the distribution of differences? What, uh, what are the extremes? Um, what's the highest value? What's the lowest value? What's the most typical value? And this kind of thing. So to look at that, um, Usually, it's a very, very good idea to start with synthetic data, i.e., data for which you know the properties before you even start doing the analysis. That allows you to verify that your understanding of the analytic procedure is correct. If you get the wrong result with synthetic data, you shouldn't believe that you can use the same procedure to get right results on your real data. So your work with synthetic data in wet lab terms is a positive control. And you always should be running positive controls. You have to treat your computational analysis just like a wet lab experiment. There should be positive controls, there should be negative controls, and there should be a lab notebook. <clears throat> but the positive control, one of the positive controls that, that we often use is um, a normal distribution. 
R has a number of, of inbuilt um, probability distributions, and the normal distribution is one of them. So the command R norm gives us <coughs> normally distributed data where we can define how many data values we want, what the mean should be, and what the standard deviation should be. But within that, they're random. Now, one more thing that, that I usually do when I use any kind of uh, random values in teaching scripts is to set the seed of the random number generator. Because it could just happen that um, if I pick, if I run this command here, um, I can get 50 values of exactly zero. Probability is very small, extremely small that this would happen, but it's possible because they're random numbers. Zero is in the range, so 50 times the same number could be the outcome of a random experiment. So in order to prevent things like that, really anomalous data cropping up and then causing great confusion to happen, is I set the seed of the random number generator. And this means, since the random number generator does not make truly physically random numbers, but so-called pseudo-random numbers that have all the properties of random numbers except they are generated by an algorithm, um, if I run the algorithm the same time over, I will get the same results. So let me illustrate. If I set seed to 1, 2, 3, 4, And then <clears throat> I throw a six sided dice twenty times. This is what I get. One, four, four, six, four, one, two, four, four. Would you believe that's a fair dice? Fair die? So many fours? It's probably loaded. Um, so if I do this again, I, of course, I get different numbers. Incidentally, this is one thing about random numbers. If you if you have truly random numbers, there's usually many, many more repetitions in the random numbers that we as humans would do if we try to write down random numbers. So we tend to make random numbers as different as possible, but that's not true randomness. Okay, now we have two sets of throwing dice, and for good measure we throw in another one. But if I set my seed value back to what it was before, and then sample again, I get exactly the same set of random numbers that I got the first time. So for all practical purposes, they're random, but they're reproducible. And this ensures, since you all are running the same random number generator on your machine, um, if you set the same seed that I set under the script, we all have the same set of um, of normal, normally distributed random numbers. So if we set C to 100 and then do this x value, <clears throat> the first value should be minus 0 0.5022 on all of the machines in the room. Any counterexamples? Thank God. OK. Very quick descriptive statistics. Many of the keywords of descriptive statistics are simply um, um, used in that way uh, in R, just like apps for absolute values, you can use mean. That's our mean value. What do you expect it should be? Zero. Zero. Do you expect zero? These are numbers from zero to 100, right? So these are 100 
normally distributed random values where the normal distribution is taken to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So do we expect zero? We don't. We don't expect zero. We expect a small number, but it would be quite unlikely that we hit exactly on zero. But we expect a small number. If this would come out as 21, I would be very, dis very much um, shaking in my confidence about the random number generator. So it's a small number. Um, median. What's the difference between mean and median? Asma. <laughs> What's the difference between mean and median? Did you ever come across that? Median is the number at the 50th percentile. OK. That's absolutely correct. Median is the number at the 50th percentile. What does that mean? I have 100 numbers. What does? It, it's done more by ranking the actual values. Exactly. So I rank them, just like sorting them or ordering <coughs> them. And then I take the 50th ranked. And there are many different ways of how to break ties if these are, um, if I have an even number of, of observations. So if I have 101, then I just take the 51st element, and there's 50 larger and 50 smaller ones. If I have 100, I need to decide what I do with the 49th and the 50th element. So do I average them, or do I take the lowest, or to, do I take the, the, the highest? or whatever. So there's different ways to compute means. Important for statistics, but usually we just uh, use the default here. Why median and not mean? In some situations, median may be more informative. A typical example is the income. That's an excellent example. That's an excellent example. So what does it mean if I take the income of the population of the United States and take the mean? It's heavily influenced by certain outliers that are really at the high end. Right. It, it's heavily influenced by a small number of individuals at the high end. And I would get a number and I would you know, look into the population. Nobody has that much money in their pockets. Virtually nobody. Um, <clears throat> What does the median mean, on the other hand? That means whatever the distribution is, the highest number of people have approximately that, that much income um, disposable. So sometimes the outliers are important. Sometimes uh, we want to suppress the outliers. Uh, sometimes the distribution is heavily skewed, like the income distribution. Um, and, and in that case, we might want to use some kind of a transformation, like a log transformation, to, f to first bring things on a more comparable scale before we, uh, we calculate means or medians. But um, note that these two values exist. They give somewhat comparable information, but you have to be aware of what the difference is. Um, What's IQR? What's it even stand for? IQR. Interquartile range. Interquartile range. Exactly. What's a quartile? Right. It's it's a concept that's closely related to the median. So, if the median <coughs> is the fiftieth value, or the value at at, at um, the 50 percent mark, once we order them, the interquartile range is the range between um, the uh, 25 and the 75 percent. <coughs> if we use the summary function, we can, we can see these things here. So the median is minus 0 0.5, the mean is uh, a small number. The first quartile is down at uh, minus 0 0.6. The third quartile is up at 0 0.6. So the interquartile range is the absolute value of this plus the absolute value of that. 
or the absolute value of the, of the difference. Um, variance and standard deviations um, <coughs> are the root of the squared difference of the values with the mean. Um, so the standard deviation is close to 1. Again, this is not surprising since the standard deviation <coughs> of this um, <coughs> this value um, is has been given as one. Okay, now let's apply this to our LPS dat. Um, which of the columns has the highest standard deviation? Can you solve that task? What do you need to do? What's the first thing you do? So conceptually, we need to know how do we calculate the standard deviation for one of the data columns, and how do we repeat that for all of the data columns? Right? So let's solve the first task first. How do we calculate the standard deviation of one of the data columns? Let's, let's do it by hand, so explicitly. There might be built-in ways to do things more explicitly. But if you use built-in functions, um, the upside is that if there are um, tricky things about the te theory of how to do that correctly, they will be taken care of in, in the R code. Um, the downside is you need to remember what there is and how to properly use it. So that's always a trade-off. If things are simple, you're probably better off just writing a few lines of code by hand. If things get more involved, um, you're better off you know, searching on how to do it correctly and then using a particular package. I find very often on, on, on the R help mailing list that people jump to packages too soon. They try to import a package and use a package before they properly understand what they're actually trying to do. And um, we, we always emphasize that Tell us a little more about what you're trying to do. And very often we find the approach is not sound. And you, then you have to go back. So the question of what's the right package to use is often an ill-posed question. So let's try to do it by hand. So let's do it just for one column. Calculating the, there's an implicit question, of course, here. Uh, LPS data contains more than just data. W what are our data columns? So we've given them names. Now if we don't have a vector of these names available, um, if we want to do things for more than one column, it does become easier um, to actually use the column numbers. So the data columns we want to work with here are columns 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 15. <coughs> All right. So calculating standard deviation, what was that command? SD. SD. Um, and we want all the rows, and we want column two. 
so we get a number. Now, how do we re repeat that for all of the numbers? All of the columns. Uh, all of the columns. So the two and the column. Copy and paste, do three, and so on, and so on. Awkward. We can do this. <laughs> but if you have 175 columns, it becomes very awkward. Um, does this work? I don't know. Sometimes these kinds of things work. Let's see if SD is smart enough. No. Right, so we can only do it column by column. Now, so we need to have a way to repeat this command over and over again, and each time with a different value here. Does that Sound like something we ought to be able to do? Can we somehow convert uh, this to a matrix? Yeah. But what would happen then is you would get the standard deviation of all of the values. You wouldn't get them individually by row. It doesn't work like MATLAB that gives you individual column wise standard. No, no, it would then throw all the, the columns, all the data values together. Um, if you want to do it by row or if you want to do it by column individually, you can do two different things. One is write a for loop that iterates and creates a variable where it does each of these measurements individually. And the other one is to use an apply statement, which works very similarly. So let's look at the iteration, for loops. We had for loops in the introductory R tutorial. We, we I think we saw a for loop yesterday, and, but we didn't really dwell on it. So let's talk briefly about for loops. I sometimes find myself um, writing phonological typos, where it's a typo that's not just fat-fingered mistyping, but but um, which has the a variant spelling of the right sound. I find that very strange. Thinking about how the brain generates that and then puts it into code. Does does anybody else have phonological typos, Brandon? You do. Nobody else does? Must come from age. Must come from tenure. <laughs> tenure. Spell T-E-N-Y-E-A-R. Why are you Now, if you think about it, you know, it's, it's really strange what, what needs to happen for that to happen. You've got your own dictation software in your head. Yep. OK, so that's the generic structure of a for loop. For whatever variable in whatever vector, do something. And th this means uh, it takes the values from that vector one by one by one by one, and then does that something. So for example, um, <clears throat> the way we often write things like that for i in one, two, Seven print i times i. <clears throat> i for index is very often used. It doesn't have to be called i. It could be called anything. So if I execute this loop, I get uh, a number of squares. And that's extremely useful. So we can, we can use this structure to get all of these standard deviations. We just plug this in. So um, we want all the columns here. So we had uh, columns 2 to 15, right? Um, 
and we want to print What should I type here? What should go into the square brackets? Space comma I. Right? So nothing where we expect rows because we want all of the rows. So not a subset selection. And here we type I. So on every iteration of this loop, i gets the value that we want. So the first iteration of the loop will give us 2, the next iteration will give us 3, and so on. So these are the standard, uh, yeah, these are the standard deviations of these values. Um, very simple statistics. Now, I kind of would prefer if I actually would have the, the, the column names there, right? How do we get column names? Where are the column names stored and available? So these are our column names. It's a vector of the column names. So could we use that instead of i? In a different way. I'm not going to show you. Ask me later. I'll show you how. But um, well, actually, what I can do is I can use call names LPS dat and then use for i in call names LPS dat. And then it will give me column name by column name by column name. And then I can use that for the selection. But what, I'm, what I can do here, simply for the printing, is Printing the call names of LPS dat in the ith position. So then I will get the first column name and so on. Right? So this value for B control, this value for B LPS, and so on. Well, that's awkward. I don't like that. I want them in the same um, in the same line. So what I what I should use here is sprint f. Print F. Okay. Now we want um, a text value, then we'll have a blank, then we'll have um, a floating point value, and then we'll have a line break. So we have two variables that we have here, the text value and the floating point value. So the text value first, then the floating point value. And that should look more nicer. <coughs> Okay, we don't we we don't just produce the value. We actually need to put it to the console 
uh, using using cat. Okay. Sorry, what does cat do here? Cat, like print, takes the text value and displays it on the console. Otherwise, the text values are just created within the loop, but nothing gets shown. This is different when you do something from line by line, then the result is shown. But within a loop, the individual inner results are not displayed on the console. So we need to do that explicitly. And we could do it explicitly with print, but then we would get the square bracket one in front of every uh, example, or we do it with cat, and then just the bare value is being shown. Just to show you the difference, this is what it would look like with print. Right, so we get the one here, and we get it in quotation marks, and we explicitly see uh, the backslash n. Whereas this just shows us the raw strings that we generated with Sprinter. Okay. Um, <coughs> Our little ad hoc exercise on um, how to look into the data set and do a little bit of descriptive statistics on the individual columns. Um, if you have any questions to that, ask us during the coffee break.